Welcome back to this conversation on American Cities Rebuilding. I am joined now by the mayor of Cleveland, Justin Bibb. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to the discussion. You know, it, when you were campaigning and when you were elected, you were talking about really refocusing on Cleveland. And what have you heard now that you've been in office throughout this year that the primary concerns are of the citizens of Cleveland? Well, uh, I'm sure any mayor uh, across the country would tell you that public safety uh, is the number one priority and remains my number one priority uh, as mayor of Cleveland. Uh, I entered office on the heels of a police involved shooting, as well as the fact that we are the only city in the country that's been under two consecutive consent decrees with the Department of Justice. And so we're leading on fighting violent crime by putting more officers on the beat emphasizing more community policing, but also doing the important work of really enforcing police accountability to keep the city safe and secure long term. Well, where do things stand now with those consent decrees? I mean, I, I don't yeah. uh, is there a, is there a sort of a, a set of criteria that you have to meet by a certain time for them to be lifted? Well, the current consent decree uh, just got extended for another uh, two years. Uh, we have been under our current consent decree since 2014 after the tragic death of our city's son, Tamir Rice. And one of the things I prioritize as mayor is leading with urgency, but also leading with the right community feedback and input so we can be compliant with the consent decree by the end of my first term. Just this week, I announced a brand new executive director of police accountability who comes to us from Oakland and Ferguson and Chicago to really spearhead our administration's effort to get compliant with our So what's current, her task? I mean, what's the focus yeah. and, and, and uh, yeah. you know, what are the, her marching orders, so to speak? Well, number one, how do we get compliant with all of the data requests the DOJ currently has? How do we uh, try to decrease the number of use of force cases uh, that we currently have right now uh, across the city? And how do we ensure that the reforms we've executed are sustained over time so that police leadership, the community, and the DOJ are all aligned working on the same page. You know, how have those conversations been with the citizens of Cleveland post George Floyd, post you being in office, where perhaps adding police might not just be the same solution that groups of citizens are looking for, while I think everyone, regardless yeah. of where they live in Cleveland, cares about being safe when they walk home at night and want crime-free neighborhoods, uh, some of them might say, well, maybe all that money shouldn't be particularly going just to police. I mean, how do you as mayor distribute those resources and say some of this perhaps needs to go into mental health or social work? It has to be a both and. It's not an either or. Uh, when I'm talking to residents, uh, they want the police to show up on time but respect their constitutional rights uh, at the same time as well. But we also have to recognize that, you know, we can't continue to, to police in the way that we did 5, 10, 15 years ago. So we're doing a couple of things in Cleveland. Number one, uh, we uh, just used our American Rescue Plan investments from President Biden to fully fund a co-responder model of policing in all five of our police districts across the city. So we have the right response to the right call. We are also looking at a care response model where social workers and mental health professionals can take those nonviolent 911 calls so they can truly be focused on addressing violent crime in the city. So it has to be in all of the above with a deeper focus on really address, addressing the root causes of violent crime that we see in cities like Cleveland across the country. Uh, just a reminder to our uh, audience that's watching live, you can add comments on the side and we'll try to get to them in this conversation with Mayor Bibb of Cleveland. Uh, Mayor, I know you work with a startup that leads kind of a new initiative trying to make cities safer, healthier, more resilient. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, prior to becoming mayor, I served as the chief strategy officer of Urban Nova, which is really focused on how do you help mid-sized cities like Cleveland better use technology? to improve the basic delivery of city services. And we saw the importance of that kind of technology need during this pandemic when, uh, when offices were closed, city halls had to continue to be open for business. And so uh, since taking office, 
you know, we've been doing a lot of work to modernize city services. Uh, prior to me being mayor, many departments in our city didn't have Windows 7 or Windows 10. Now, <laughs> roughly 99% of all of our employees at City Hall not finally have Microsoft 365. That may not seem like a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to us in sure. Cleveland. Uh, so that building and housing and public safety can all share documents and work on the same accord. We're modernizing our 311 system so that constituents can call and get their potholes fixed and track their complaint like a FedEx package. You know, mm -hmm. my residents want the same kind of technology and customer service that they get from the Amazons and FedExes of the world. And it's our job as mayor uh, to innovate and get there as quickly as we possibly can. I know you used to work with Teach for America in Ohio, and I know education is important to you, even when on a listening tour. What did you hear from teachers and students and parents coming off this pandemic where we have seen significant learning loss, especially in communities where students are already behind, they fell behind farther. Yeah. Well, uh, the biggest thing I've heard is that our teachers and our students have gone through so much, uh, so much over the last two years, uh, over the, as we experienced the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And, you know, one thing that's important is that we uh, as leaders in our respective communities must do a better job of investing in the emotional and mental health supports for our young people to achieve and thrive. The other thing that's important is that we need a more comprehensive strategy to address the learning loss that we've experienced uh, over the last several years due to COVID-19. We really need a Marshall Plan for the nation to address the learning loss we've experienced throughout the pandemic. And so we're really focused on closing the gaps we've seen in math, science, and reading to ensure that our children are ready for college work and life in 21st century. But the other big, big headwind we're facing now is, you know, we're losing many of our high school students to Amazon, Target, and McDonald's because they're paying $19, $20 an hour already while these students are in high school. And so the value proposition of public education must change to ensure that America can compete for the future. So how do you do that? How do you convince someone that <clears throat> an investment, and I phrase it that way specifically, in higher education for another two years at a community college to get an associate's degree or four years, if that's possible for them, is worth and that it, worth it and that it will have a return, especially for parents who see skyrocketing costs of higher education and say, son or daughter, I don't know if this is what we need to be mortgaging the house for, for you to come back and sit in debt. Uh, it, for the first part of your life. You mentioned a very important point, and I think it's putting higher ed on notice right now. Um, for a lot of people in this economy, going to a four-year college doesn't make any economic sense. And in many cases, that's correct. I think that's why we have to think differently about how do we have an individualized learning pathway for all of our young people across the United States going to a, a public school specifically. And so what does that mean for Cleveland? We have thousands of jobs in Northeast Ohio uh, in my respective region in healthcare and advanced manufacturing that doesn't require a four-year degree. So we're working with our leaders in workforce development to expose young people to those pathways, not just in high school, but also in middle school. So that by the time you're a freshman or a sophomore in high school, you know exactly what's your path. You can be in the building trades and have a great middle-class life, or you can go off to Cleveland State, become a nurse, and also have a great middle-class life. To me, that's what education should be all about, centering the work uh, around improving public education, around the strengths, the interest, and passion of our young people, and that's the work we're trying to lead every day across the city of Cleveland. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, climate change as well. Your city right there on a great lake. Uh, how do you feel the impacts? I know that, uh, you know, the New York governor, I think she just declared a state of emergency today yeah. because they're about to get a, a, an insane amount of snow. I don't want to get the number of inches wrong, but it was in double digits and it's going to be several feet of snow. And 
you know, uh, whether that storm you feel the effect of or a different one, um, you were also part of kind of a delegation to the COP27 talks. What was your interest? What are you trying to uh, express? Well, Cleveland has a unique story when it comes to uh, the nation's fight for sustainability and, and climate justice. You don't get the Clean Water Act uh, or the EPA without the work that uh, my predecessor, the late Carl B. Stokes, did as the first elected black mayor of a major American city uh, to really lead the fight for climate justice when our river caught on fire uh, 50 years ago. And after uh, Mayor Stokes did that pollution tour, it really elevated the importance of us fighting for clean water and clean air to breathe in cities like Cleveland across the nation. And so what I did as mayor is a couple of things. Number one, during my transition, I really embedded a focus on climate justice in every job description of leaders in my cabinet. We just launched a pilot earlier this year to allow for low to middle income households to have free solar panels on their roofs to cut down on their energy uh, expenses. And, you know, we are living in what I call America's North Coast, right on Lake Erie. We are a green city on a blue lake with 20 percent of the world's fresh water right here and America's North Coast. And so we are trying to attract all those folks who don't want to see hurricanes in Miami, come to <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio, because we are ready to welcome you to our great city. You know, I, I also know that you've had to deal with sort of algal blooms along the lake. You've had, uh, you know, invasive species come down through the rivers. I mean, th there's lots of different ways that you can kind of look at what happens when the climate changes. And, yeah. and it might not just be hurricane, certainly not in your case, but you're feeling the impacts already. Absolutely. Uh, that's why we've been really focused on things like a plastic bag ban uh, to really cut down on those toxins that uh, occur in our lake. Uh, that's why you know having great relationships uh, with our federal delegation in Washington, D.C. and our leaders in the governor's mansion in Columbus to make sure that we're investing at every level of government to protect our freshwater asset in Lake Erie. And uh, I just joined the board of the St. Lawrence Pathways organization that's also really focused on protecting our great American asset of, of the Great Lakes. And so it has to be a, a truly public-private partnership approach to protect uh, this important asset for our city long-term. Speaking of that partnership, uh, Peter Hansen online asks, could the mayor discuss if he's partnering with organizations like the Cleveland Foundation to spur investment and jobs? Yes, absolutely. We are so lucky to have the Cleveland Foundation, the world's first community foundation, by the way, right here in Cleveland. And the Cleveland Foundation is really putting uh, their money where their mouth is. They are moving their headquarters from downtown to an historic black neighborhood uh, in the Huff neighborhood of Cleveland, where we saw one of the most violent riots in the country during the height of the civil rights movement. And so that investment spurring a brand new generation of good paying jobs, of equitable economic development. And I'm encouraging more of our community foundations and corporations to truly invest in our forgotten black and brown neighborhoods to turn around our city once and for all. Uh, James Crane online asked, taking on big education, absolutely correct. We need to be focused on our people and their needs, not on the providers of those services. Hence the issue with debt forgiveness. Uh, it does nothing to stop big education and price inflation. Is student debt something that you are hearing about as uh, a reason that young people are going either directly into the workforce or considering not going to school? Absolutely. I think for a lot of young people, um, they are impatient uh, with uh, the pace of change they're seeing uh, in education, particularly in higher education. Um, and, you know, as, is, as the mayor of the second poorest big city in the country, yeah. poverty is a real thing. And so people want access to a good paying job now. And so upskilling quicker, not just for our students in K through 12 education, but even for our adult learners that are currently in the workforce, upskilling them also must be a priority for our cities to for us to be competitive long term. So we must think about the entire spectrum when it comes yeah. to workforce development. 
There was a question from Hafsa Asi. I'm sorry if I got your last name wrong. Can Mayor Bibb share how digitally inclusive the city is for disadvantaged residents? Yeah. Also speak to any digital equity uh, endeavors, please. Well, if we learn anything uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic outside of when it hit the mute button on Zoom, it is the, it's the fact that access to high-speed broadband uh, is not a luxury. It needs to be a basic economic and civil right uh, in this economy. Uh, prior to becoming mayor, Cleveland was ranked the least connected city in the country, and uh, that is not good enough for me as mayor of the city. And so um, we are using $30 million from our American Rescue Plan investments from President Biden uh, to connect up to 50,000 families with high-speed broadband. We'll be announcing our provider for that over the next couple of weeks here. And then our second phase uh, strategy is really focused on how do we unlock the power of fiber in disadvantaged parts of our city that were digitally redlined over the last several decades? Because without smart fiber, you can't be a smart city. And we want to make sure we can invest in that next generation of technology uh, across Cleveland. But when you think about broadband right now and considering, as you mentioned, how reliant people were on the Internet. Yeah. Should it be treated as a utility? I mean, or is it still, I mean, you know, it, it's, I can hear arguments in my own head about how it goes, but as you look at this as a city, as you look at this in kind of long-term planning as part of the sort of infrastructure in the yeah. ether that helps so many other things, you know, should we be sitting around saying, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, this provider is horrible for me and whatever, but when it comes down to, you know, all the people that are relying on it, if you're working from home, if you're trying to school your kids, et cetera. I think you're right, Harry. Um, we, it must be thought about as a public good and a, or a public utility. Um, unfortunately, as you know, it's very complicated with the telecom market yeah. and regulatory aspects of it. That's why the federal action we've seen from President Biden to really help uh, us city leaders on the ground put real capital to work to address the short term need. But long term, uh, we need our leaders in Washington to do a better job of, of cutting down on these telecom companies who prey and redline communities of color in cities like Cleveland. That is unacceptable. Uh, and with, without a real leadership uh, on this issue in DC, as mayors, we have to act. And that's why we're using this money to connect as many families as we can to bring real change as quickly as possible in cities like Cleveland all across the country. So if you could um, wave your wand, look in the future and see back at a bib administration. Yeah. Let's not uh, let's not put an end to how long it's going to last. What would you what would you like to accomplish? Well, um, one thing I always have dreamed about. I'm a big reader of the Economist magazine, and one time Pittsburgh was ranked uh, as the number one most livable city on the cover of the Economist magazine. That's my goal for Cleveland. I want okay. us to be a national model for uplifting Black women. I want us to be a national model for climate justice where you can breathe clean air, drink clean drinking water, and have a park you can walk to in your neighborhood yeah. because we're a 15 minute city. To me, that's what make Cleveland a great American city once again, and that's what I'm fighting for every single day. Yeah. The other thing I think our audience is gonna recognize looking at you is that you're, the, I think, the second youngest mayor yep. of yep. Cleveland, right? So, and I wonder, how do you, not just inspire uh, the next generation of leadership in the city, um, but I, I don't, it, it's sort of a generational question, I guess. Um, how do you politely nudge people who've been there a long time to move on, that there are younger people that are ready to take over? I mean, you kind of see that conversation happening that Nancy Pelosi and the Speaker of the yeah. House just said that she's stepping down from leadership and that there's another generation certainly ready to take over. So how do you make sure that um, this, the, the two or three generations that are traditionally not in power right now see access to positions of influence in Cleveland's future? Well, um, you know, when I was campaigning last year, there are many people who told me to wait my turn, that I was too young, mm -hmm. I had no experience to, to be mayor of the city. But as my mom has always told me as a kid growing up in Cleveland, well done is better than well said. So I knocked on doors, I showed up everywhere, and I showed the residents what bold, dynamic 
visionary leadership could look like, despite the fact that I was only 34 years old when I campaigned for mayor last year. And I think being present in the community, particularly continuing to go to high schools and middle schools uh, and engage with the youth is the best thing I can do to inspire the next mayor uh, to one day be mayor of this great city who may come from a background like I came from. Being mm -hmm. present, giving them exposure, and seeing themselves in me is the best thing I can do to inspire the next generation. All right, Mayor Justin Bibb of Cleveland, thank you so much for your time and thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Take care.